On the screen is a slide with the words Interveners 101 with Linda Elsap. Below the words are the logo for the WESP DHH Wisconsin Deafblind Technical Assistance Project, WDDTAP, and the logo for Ideas That Work. Three individuals appear on a Zoom screen. One is an ASL sign language interpreter. We are so lucky to have Linda here with us today. Linda oversees the intervener training coursework at Utah State University. She leads the National Intervener and Advocate Association. She continues to work to advocate for system change on behalf of individuals who are deafblind. Um, here in Wisconsin, we've been very fortunate to work alongside Linda for many years. And we're very excited to have Linda here today to just share about the role of intervener. So I'm gonna turn it on over to you, Linda. Thank you, Jen. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. If anybody has problems hearing, I know my mic gets a little glitchy. So just put it in the chat and I'll try to accommodate. So. Thank you, Jen, for that introduction. Uh, it's been my pleasure and continues to be my pleasure to work with, with, with Wisconsin. You have such a wonderful state and uh, progressive and um, open-minded and very much, uh, advocate, very much advocacy for children who are deafblind. So I appreciate your attendance today. I'm excited that so many of you want to know about interveners and what this is all about and why children who are deafblind benefit and need them. And hopefully uh, it will give you information that you can then share or use to articulate what this is all about and to advocate for the students with whom you work. So I'm going to- I'll go ahead and get started. And again, I think Jen explained uh, if you have a question specific to what I'm saying, I'm happy to clarify it. So <clears throat> I'll just share my screen here and we'll get started. So this presentation is, I titled it Interveners what, why, and how. And you can see this was, uh, the wrong date is on that, but I didn't get to go in and change the date. So this was what we used earlier. So I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, I always try to remember to think of Annie Sullivan and Helen Keller. When I think of the role of this person, I, you know, we just can track it way back to early history where we our famous uh, Helen Keller uh, had to have someone with her. It was Annie Sullivan at the time that we could say that was her intervener or her teacher or whatever, but she had to be there. And if you study Helen Keller's life, you'll find that she always had someone with her. It wasn't always Annie Sullivan, but uh, Helen said, ever since she took my hand on the doorstep of my home, she's been not only my eyes and ears, but also a light in all dark places, a bond between me and the life of the world. And this really says what we're going to talk more about, what the deaf blindness is a disability cuts our children, our students off from the world in various levels or degrees. But it is, it is a dark place. And so what we'll be talking about is, you know, what we can do about that to change that. If we think about just a definition of deaf blindness, every state has something a little bit different, but this is the one I use. Uh, if we think about what deaf blindness is, we have to talk about information flow, right? So uh, we talk about what how the brain forms and the fact that there we go. Information is really important. And if we look at videos of brain development, all of the early development is based on information. The information, auditory, visual, tactile, movement, everything goes into the brain 
there are there are little neurons that register that information that save it that connect it to other parts of the brain so information is what we all have to have and what we have to rely on so with our typical vision and hearing we get it right we all get that flow of information babies get it from the moment they're born they have that now, when we have a loss of one of our senses, our strong senses are, of course, vision and hearing because those we do at a distance. But if we have one of those, we have a shift right in learning. So a child with a vision loss, they use their hearing to compensate for the lack of visual information. And it works well. The hearing can compensate. It's strong enough. So our visually impaired people do, do very well and they use their hearing. And actually we have research that shows that the brain actually develops more ability to use auditory information because uh, the visual uh, neurons are not being used. So if we think of a child who's hearing loss, who has a hearing loss, those were the students I worked with initially, they have to rely on their vision to compensate for their lack of hearing. And it works, right? So when I taught my deaf students, I used visuals. I used to ASL and sign language as a visual information and it works. We can make that compensation and we can teach that way. What changes here is that when we have a student with both, we have both vision and hearing loss, no matter what the degree, we've got a shift now in the flow of information. It isn't the same. It's not what you and I have, you know, or the typical sighted and hearing child. This natural flow isn't there. It doesn't occur. It might come in pieces. It might, it's, it's incomplete. It might be distorted if there's CEI issues or if there's a central auditory processing, but basically it's not complete and it can't be accessed. The student can't access it and it's not reliable enough for learning. So neither one of the senses, no matter how strong they are, they are not strong enough to compensate for the lack of the other one. So what we're talking about in the purest sense of the word with deaf blindness, it's a disability of access and it's access to information. That's it. We start, we say we have to have information. Well, this disability prevents access to information and it's mainly visual and auditory about the world. There can be other access pieces, but, but uh, such as uh, other disabilities, but we're looking mainly excuse me, basically at vision and hearing. So I'm often um, asked about how do you know if your child's really deaf blind? And I still see and go in and work with teens who don't put the label deaf blind because the child has a lot of hearing or the child may have a lot of vision. And so they don't think of the child as a deaf blind child and then the supports aren't there. But if we just ask the simple questions, which John McGinnis did years ago, was, is there enough vision to compensate for the lack of hearing? Is there enough hearing to compensate for the lack of vision? If the answer is no, then the child is learning as a deafblind child. The learning shifts. Whatever label is there on the student, it's the learning that shifts. Uh, I'm involved with a student right now who, because she has a mild to moderate hearing loss, has not been determined as deafblind. Her vision is all over the map, but because they think her, you know, her ability to hear is enough, they haven't given her educational programming specific to deafblindness, and there's a lot of issues related to that. So. If we look at this and we say, well, okay, now what is it? So if we have a lack of access, if we don't have a compensatory distant sense, if we can't say to ourselves, I'm sure that hearing is compensating, or I'm sure the vision is compensating, then we have a learning style that is different, okay? So if we look at the way you and I learn, or those of us with vision and hearing, this is the pretty much the way we all learn. We learn uh, a lot directly with hands-on experience. Secondary is what we're doing today. We're listening to other people talk or present. 
the majority of what you and I or those of with this vision and hearing have learned has come incidentally. It's just automatically, it comes with the flow of information. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to work hard to gather. When we walk into a room, we see who's there, we see the clothes they wear. We get all kinds of information that comes to us incidentally. And so that's pretty much typically how uh, we all have learned. Now, if we say for a child who's deaf blind, this is again where the, the difference is. And so we have to flip our pyramid upside down and say for these children, incidental learning is not efficient. It doesn't, it may not even occur, but it's not very effective. There might be some flow of information, but the incidental piece is just not strong enough, especially for learning. Secondary is very difficult, right? Because there have to be pieces in place, a communication system or ability to access what secondary information is coming in. So direct experiences <clears throat> or hands-on, that is really the best and only way some of these children will learn. That doesn't mean they won't pick up information or be able to do some things, but we're talking about progress. We're talking about kids who learn and are able to make progress in school. So the, the struggle here then is the, the needs are different from those are typically cited in hearing children. And that's challenging for education because the, our, our educational classrooms and our system is not designed for intensive amounts of hands-on learning, direct hands-on learning. And it just isn't that way. I've taught in school and I didn't have to think about that. As a teacher, I wasn't taught to do that. So we have already a challenge in place for educational systems. So here's a little graphic um, that it just talks a little bit about the information. Sometimes it's helpful to see it visually. This is what we're all doing right now. We're getting information, it just comes in. And here's the process. There are seven steps that we're all going through that we have to go through whenever we have information. The first thing you see there is receiving. We have to receive the information. That's first, first and foremost. Then we have to attend to it, right? So if someone comes in and talks to us, we have to oh, attend and focus on it and listen. Then we gather everything, all the information, and we have to interpret it. What is it? Is it fearful? Is it information I know? We synthesize it. We put it in with uh, other information and generalize it. Is it stuff we've already learned? Is it something that's that we have to defend ourselves against? And all of that our brain is doing. And then finally, hopefully, we're remembering. I feel like sometimes that remembering piece, we don't always get that far, but that's where it's stored in the amygdala. But these seven steps have to occur for us to get something stored in the brain and to be able to remember the information that's coming in. So if we think of deaf blindness or we think of vision and hearing loss, now we can think in terms of there being a barrier or an inability for that information to get in. Some may get in auditorily, right? Some may get in visually, but it's not complete. So if you look at this seven-step process again, you can see that the very first part of the process is receiving. So if our students don't receive the information, none of the other stuff will work effectively. We won't have attending or gathering or interpreting any of that because receiving is the gate. So we're dealing again with a disability where the receiving of information is problematic, is not there, is incomplete, is a struggle. So we have to think accordingly about that. So again, we can think of how do our students receive information? Well, there has to be a delivery system. There has to be a way to overcome. And wearing hearing aids, wearing glasses is inadequate. It's not enough to be able to provide access to all the information. So we have a system in place, a person who is delivering that information 
And then we have to have a receiving system. So not just a delivery system, but someone who will receive the information from the deafblind individual. So we have to have that back and forth for communication and interaction. So we kind of know we've talked about what the problem is. So how do we solve it? You know, what is the answer to this, to the lack of access, to the lack of being able to learn? How do we, how do we prevent that? How do we teach to that? What is intervention? So we've got to have some things in place. First of all, this connection. Uh, it is such a disconnection. Um, and if you ever want to have an experience, try putting on a blindfold and earplug and put earplugs in, and then try going about your day. See what it's like to be disconnected from the world and the information that you need to function. It will open your eyes terrifically. And I always have my students do this. So again, we just said this, it's got to provide access to as clear and as consistent as we can visual and auditory information. And then we have to have the in and out, the communication, because again, one of the very most crippling things about deafblindness is the lack of communication. Because of the lack of incidental information, our children don't just develop communication naturally, a system. They don't necessarily develop the way to, to, uh, to learn it or to express themselves. So we have to have that in place. And then well, there's lots of research on social and emotional well being. It comes out almost every week to me. It's really a big deal now, not for kids with disabilities, but for all children. And so social and emotional well-being is very much recognized as an integral step for learning, right? So if kids don't feel safe, if they have anxiety, if they don't, if they're confused, learning will not happen. So we have to think in terms of deafblind intervention providing that also, because deafblindness can be pretty scary and isolating. And we see that in our students who may act out or they may shut down or go inward. <clears throat> so if we look at the role of the intervener, it's a person who works with the student to connect them. So it's one-to-one. -one. And then that intervener has to be able to know how to provide those other three things, the access to information, the communication system, and the social and emotional well-being. <clears throat> so if we look at the role of the intervener, it's these three things that we just talked about. It's to provide what's missing, what the disability itself will not provide, what it takes away, what it, what it provides a barrier to. So <clears throat> this role of the intervener has been around a long time, stood the desk test of time. I've had deafblind adults tell me that they agree with this because they need access to information so they know how to function or what to do. They need someone to communicate with, whatever their system is, and they want to feel safe. They want to feel successful and safe, and they need uh, a partner or someone who help, will help them do that. I wanted to throw in here a little bit of research, uh, if anybody wants more. Uh, Jude Nicholas is from Norway. He's a researcher whose research I've followed over the years because he does a lot of brain research related to deafblind children. He's probably one of the few that's done it over time. And he just put out a document on tactile working memory but he talks about his research and then he has specific strategies that you can implement. So again, uh, we can send that out if you're interested, but this is what he said, one of his quotes, children with deaf blindness do not utterly lack the ability to share social engagement and attention with others. Some people feel that they can't do that. Instead, they do so though through bodily tactile modalities. So, it's a bodily tactile, it's a tactile modality. So without the vision and hearing being strong enough, the tactile modality steps up as one of our major things to do. And the bodily tactile modality is important. 
So if the access to the partner's body is such that the person with congenital deaf blindness can make sense of what the partner is doing, they can have joined attention. So you can see that in the picture. What he talks a lot about is tactile communication, tactile experiences, joint attention through tactile experiences. So again, the research shows how important that is for these kids to be able to communicate. Another quote I like, he uses the interaction partner um, when he, in, in this research, this program that he's put out, he didn't use the term intervener, but you'll see everywhere, interaction partner, interaction partner. So nothing happens, nothing occurs without a partner. So he says <clears throat> that person plays an essential role in conveying and interpreting messages and utterances, but is also to engage in conversations that have mutual interaction and equal participation. In this communication approach, the sensitive and responsive competencies of the partners are seen as crucial for the child's learning and motivation. Crucial, meaning it has to be there. And those partners need to have highly developed skills, sensitivities, and insights to participate in the world of children with deaf blindness, where touch and proximity are crucial. I remember early on when someone would say interveners are not going to work, that's not a good idea because they're in the child's space. You know, they have to be too close to the child or they have to touch the child too much. Well, here's our research now saying you have to do it. It's crucial. It is part of intervention for these kids. There is proximity, there is touch, and there is a partner. Again, I wanted to give you that research because it's helpful. Also, the interaction partner plays an important role in adapting the learning environment providing possibilities for shared exploration and supporting tactile perceptual strategies, such as providing time, opportunity, and supportive active exploratory procedures to systematically explore an object or identify it or localize it. So he emphasizes that, not, that, his, that his plan there in this tactile learning memory worksheet, a partner has to be there. And um, I am still surprised that we that I can go into classrooms and not see partners. Not there may be an aide there, but not someone with training who can truly be an interaction partner. Okay, so any questions at this point? Um, I'll just just stop and see if we have any questions. I'm going. I'm giving you, I'm trying to do this PowerPoint in sections so that you can ask me if you have questions about it. Anything at this point? Jen, anything I need to respond to? Linda, this is Jen. There's not been anything in the chat and I don't see any hands raised at this point. Okay. All right, so we'll move on and just say, one of the things that happens is that there's this feeling or when districts are sitting down to decide what an intervener is and does, a classroom aide is often assigned to the deafblind child. So we will see an aide or a paraprofessional that is there with the student, but that person doesn't necessarily have any training. So what's the difference? There is a booklet that is on the intervener.org website, and maybe, Jen, you could put that in the chat. That's the website that has everything about interveners, and we continue to add information. But there's a booklet for teens that I know Jen can help you get, uh, but it has in here this chart that talks about what's different between the intervener and the paraprofessional. You can see they both work under the direction of the classroom teacher. The only exception I've seen to this is that sometimes the intervener works from a quote a co-op or is in there by an agency. So they still collaborate with the teacher, but they have an outside supervisor. So that's the only um, difference I've seen there. Uh, they both by, abide by school policies. You know, that's a given for that. 
uh, a paraprofessional can work with groups of students or one on one, depending, whereas the intervener only works with one student and facilitates intervention all the time, that access, that flow of information always. But also the intervener has to have specialized training in deaf blindness. It's not something an aide would do. An aide would, you know, doesn't usually receive disability specific training, but the classroom aides or the paraprofessionals, they're wonderful people, but they have to have a certain skill set to be able to do this. This isn't just like supporting a child while they're eating lunch or while they're you know, in different environments. Um, the intervener has to have skills in communication methods, very much so communication, environmental access, sensory loss, and trying to show, to help the student make their own choices. Another question that comes up is doesn't that create dependency? If you have an intervener with a student who's deaf blind, are they going to become dependent on that intervener? And so that's part of their training is that they are there to help the deaf blind student make as many decisions as possible, interact with other students as much as possible, but not to create dependency. So if Again, that's something that's a training piece that those that don't have training wouldn't know how to do or wouldn't be thinking to do. Um, the intervener has to have time to prepare materials for that student. And paraprofessional may be responsible for materials for the whole class or for helping with cutting and copying. So what the intervener does is works with the teacher and helps prepare the materials that need to be prepared. For example, Braille, we have an intervener who works with a student who needs Braille. So she gets the, the lesson plans and she gets, gets everything Braille for the student. So she has to have time to do that. The teacher doesn't do it, but the intervener can do it because she has the uh, knowledge and the skills to do that. So, um, Whatever the materials are that the student needs, that's what the intervener can do. Uh, the intervener is not assigned to classroom maintenance or usually um, assigned to um, playground duty or driving a van on a field trip. That's really not what the intervener is there to do because they're there to be that connection for the student. Um, you can see, you guys know, you teachers, the paraprofessionals do do that kind of thing. Uh, they don't typically attend planning meetings or IEP meetings, but it's critical that the intervener attend the planning meetings and the IEP meetings. Why have an IEP meeting if the intervener who's with the child day to day to day isn't there to weigh in on information about progress or information about goals? Then um, I already said not assigned to school duties. Um, they're also very mindful of connecting the deafblind students to other children, to other students, to peers, being a bridge to the world, <clears throat> making sure that that child feels safe, that there's interactions going on so they can have friends. You know, again, deafblindness uh, isolates, cuts one cuts you off, cuts these students off from their peers. And that's one of the things that they are trained and work very hard to do. So they are different from an aide. And when, um, when classrooms or when um, IEP teams are considering it, they often will say we're fine because an aide is in place, uh, but again, the question is that the child's needs aren't met because that aid would have to get training in order to be able to provide intervention for that's deafblind specific. I wanted to just give you a few of the child outcomes change in children. You know, as we think it through logically, if we just put logic and common sense to what we know about the brain, about information, we know that if you put someone in place with that student that has the skills to give them the information and communicate, we are going to see child change. 
we are going to see progress. I can tell you that in all the years I have been working and training interveners, there will be progress. It, I have never seen a situation where these students don't make progress. This was a, a small study that was done in a state under a deafblind project person where they had, um, they did some pre and pulse. So they got it with a trained intervener. The, this was the change that was done there. 13% of course, uh, joint attention. What's really important is to notice 25% social skills went up. That's pretty big. 38% increase in self-determination, choice making, 50% decrease in behaviors. 50% and an increase, of course, in all these other skills. We know that students who are deafblind have behaviors. That's been since ever I remember um, in, in defining or understanding deafblind children and their, their classroom experiences. And we see behaviors. Very typically, we see um, uh, we see both ends of the continuum. We may have a student who just is kind of shut down and quiet, who doesn't really participate, who kind of disengages and doesn't do anything. The other thing we might see is a student who yells out or who throws things or who drops things or who refuses to engage or who gets up and tries to escape. Um, so there are different behaviors that we will see and I'm sure those of you, if you've worked with deafblind children, you know what some of those are. Some of those also can be related to sensory issues. And what we know, especially for those children who have tactile communication and engagement with their hands, we know that some of those self-stimulation behaviors really decrease because their hands are in use for other things. There's 63% exploration and 88% time in a calm state. That's fabulous. That's a lot. And 100% increase in expressive communication. I mean, this is a small study, but I see this again and again. It is indicative of what we see with that intervener there. And um, the expressive communication is huge. You know, if we can get, pull it out, because these kids many times aren't expressive. So we've tried to do, a, you know, bigger studies. There's also an old study, the BIP study, that we can give you information on. But it was similar. The behaviors, the calmness, the increase in expressive communication always go up. Um, I guess I just, I left this in here so that you would know that intervener.org has resources. Uh, for families, there's a family guide there that you can just link on, you can share with maybe any of the families you're working with. Um, Deaf Blindness and the Role of the Intervener is a video that you'll find on that website that is, you know, some people need to see it in action and a picture that will show uh, interveners in actions. Uh, and that's a good one to show and share. Comparison of interveners and paraprofessionals, I just showed to you. Interveners in the classroom is one you'll want to get because that is a guideline for teens. So that breaks down what the intervener does, what the teacher can do, what an administrator can do, and how they work together, how it all works together. So that is a uh, book that, that you can uh, be able to access. And then we have a Facebook page. I don't know if you do Facebook, but if you do, you can just put in the search interveners deaf and deaf blindness. And uh, one of our parents keeps that page current. There's a lot of videos on there, conversation, announcements, but good examples of children who have interveners and how that's supposed to look. You know, we always want to see what does this look like? So there's uh, some resources. So if there are any other questions, we'll go into training. So are we still good, Jen? This is Jen, yes. There are no questions at this time. Okay. So let's talk about training. 
you know, now we know we can't just have somebody there. It's not a body issue, right? It's not about having somebody there. It's about having a skill set there. It's having someone who knows. So with the, if we use the term interveners, it did come out of Canada with an OR spelling. Uh, anyone who has those skills could be called an intervener. So I can go in and act as an intervener for a deafblind student if no one else is there to provide that specific intervention. So as we're talking about it specifically here, it's a job title, it's a job description, it's a person in educational settings. But just know that that doesn't mean a parent can't develop those skills and act as the intervener or someone else, a teacher can do that also. So what we had to do again, we've been doing a lot of systems change since 2002. And so we had to come up with competencies for interveners and that was done and approved by CEC in 2008. And those are listed on the website. So if you want to see what those competencies look like, we had to say, well, just like us, any of us that have been teachers or related service providers, we have to have competencies and knowledge and skills. So those were approved by 2008. And with some change, those are still being adhered to today, especially in higher education. Um, for a long time, I did uh, training of interveners through on-site, uh, monthly on-site trainings, uh, through workshops and that kind of thing. And that is still occurring today, maybe in the state that you're in. Um, what, what I learned and what the research supports is that it's very difficult to develop the level of skills and competence that you need in what's called like a monthly training or an in-service training or whatever. It's just not, their accountability isn't the same as if you're a student. And so um, I was, I moved over to higher ed in about 2006 with the grant and now totally support because I've done it both ways. I know what the progress was that I saw. So how, why is higher ed important? Well, it's the foundation for all of us, right? We all, teachers, related service providers, everybody has to go through some kind of higher ed training to, to be recognized as a profession. Interpreters have had to do that. Related services providers all go through that. Uh, we know that state and local systems will recognize the value of training through higher ed. You know, some states have said, well, They'll be a paraprofessional, but if we want them to be valued at that higher level, then they have to have some kind of higher education. The uni universities and colleges have structures in place to sustain and to ensure quality, to sustain it. There's rigor. The instructors have to be qualified. Uh, the program has to be evaluated. There's accountability for learning. Knowledge gain is done, there's personal attention, there's supervised practicums. So when I talk about higher ed training, these pieces are in place for training today. It's something that um, we have worked on and there are several universities. So uh, there's three of them right now that I've got here in case <laughs> you get to that point where you'll be recommending or wanting to know where training occurs. Utah State University, I've had a training program since 2009. Central Michigan has a training program since 2016. And Shawnee State University in Ohio has started their program in 2020. And so they're kind of in the, in the beginning stages. But again, three good programs that are available to train uh, Shawnee, I don't know if they're doing out-of-state students, but certainly USU and Central Michigan are. So if you know of someone or you see an, an intervener being assigned to a student, it's important for you to be aware that uh, the recommendation is for higher ed training, or at least we're working on that to try to elevate and show that these people really have a very specialized skill set. There's also a credential. Um, we were told early on in our systems change work that you have to have a level. You have to have something that recognizes 
this the competencies that these people have. So we do have a national intervener credential that's been in place for a number of years now. It's through higher education. So it's through any of the higher education people. Uh, it also ha is helping, we're trying to do a lot of systems change that I'll share with you. And the credential is a way of showing that. So, if, you know, just like you have licensure as a teacher or an interpreter has licensure or a certificate or uh, a certification, that's the same type of pathway here. There's also NRC Para, which provides credentialing to these people, or NIA, the National Intervener and Advocate Association, which is the group that I work with, which Heidi and Jen and Jolene are a part of. And that's because, again, we're trying to recognize that interveners are not paraeducators, are not paraprofessionals. They are a level above. Uh, and they are more like an interpreter. So if someone asks you and said, well, how do you view them and what their training is? Well, their training is viewed more as an interpreter is. If any of you are interpreters, we've got our interpreters here with us today. You can be sure that they have gone through higher ed, that they've passed tests, that they have to have a certain skill set in order to be able to do what they're doing for us here today. And that's very similar to the pathway that we're on with intervener services. There is a national certification that some of you, I'm sure, have heard about. Um, and that goes through the Para 2 Center out of Colorado. And that particular certification is based on people who get the certification outside of higher ed. So if any of you have questions about that, this is uh, a state or a group that can go through what's called the AHOA modules, open hands, open access. They though still have to do, a, they don't do a practicum, but they do a portfolio that is reviewed. And then uh, this para two center will award them a certificate. But the, and the difference is that it's out, outside of higher education there isn't a practicum involved. So the field of deafblindness itself is still really diverse in terms of what training pathway uh, people are on. Uh, we also have some states that are doing their own training. And um, I don't know if, I know that Arizona, I think I saw some people on from Arizona. Arizona is doing their, uh, they're doing training. And I think they're providing a certificate of completion or something, but it's an, the important thing for you to take away is that it's kind of all over the map right now. There is, we, we have been not, not far enough down the road to get the consensus on all of what the training should look like. And so when you're out there in the field or talking to people, then you may hear a diversity of opinion. Someone's saying, well, you know, they're going the certification through uh, the Para 2 Center. Others may say they're going through higher education to get their credential. Um, I just wanted you to be informed of that and to know that we still have diversity and we're working hard as a field to try to come together more on this so it's not so confusing. But right now, it is a bit confusing if any of you have questions. Um, we also recognized early on in about 2006 that we needed a national or a professional organization like interpreters have. We've kind of looked at how that practice evolved and we've wanted to say, well, that's, that's a good example of how a practice evolves. And uh, they have their own professional organization. There's the Registered Interpreters for the Deaf. There's the National Interpreters for the Deaf. There's several organizations. And then in a state, I think, each state may have their own. But the idea is there is a professional organization in place. And that's the same thing for teachers. You know, we have the NEA uh, nationally. I know that 
uh, OTs and PTs have their own professional associations that they work with. So this is now the professional organization for interveners. And it's, Na it's NIA, National Intervener and Advocate Association. Here's the mission. We have a group of interveners who lead out in this. They are credentialed higher ed interveners that serve on the leadership board. And um, we meet with them, they weigh in on this and they helped come up with this mission statement. Their, <clears throat> the, the mission is to promote quality intervention, to promote recognition at the state level. We still have some, we have states that have made progress and have the word intervener in their state regulations but we have some states who don't, who don't recognize the term, for whom some people are worried to mention interveners. So the advocacy is promote the acceptance of the term as a unique professional or practice and promote awareness that this really makes a difference to children. It promotes child change to help net, interveners to network and then very importantly, we've been involved in systems change to have interveners recognized as related service providers under IDEA, just like interpreters are. So if you go to related services, you'll see interpreters there. You'll see uh, occupational therapists there. Um, you'll see those people recognized and we've been advocating strongly through authorization the problem we've had is that IDEA doesn't come up for reauthorization so that those changes can be made and it doesn't look like it's any anytime soon. So we're working on other areas to try to get that done. But I wanted you to be familiar with this professional organization. If any of you know interveners or rub shoulders with them or have anything to do with them, they can easily join. It doesn't cost and it will put them in the network of interveners. Um, let's talk about how intervener services can be determined. Uh, that seems to be where a lot of uh, people are still kind of stuck. And maybe you have some examples of that. Uh, we put together, we had parents who put together a family's guide, but you can use this. It's a resource you can use with your IP teams or with parents. The idea here was to talk about the law and how do we how do we work within the law to um, I'll go back to be able to provide. Um, it's not coming. Sorry. Anyway, this is linked on the website. You can go in and look at that. It talks about what the law says about children with disability. It talks about access. Right, access is in the law in IDEA so many times. I went in and tried to count and I stopped counting because access is everywhere in IDEA. And when we think about access, what do we know? Our children, deafblind children, don't have access. They can walk in the door of a school and they don't have access. So it's not about the classroom, it's not about the school building, it's not about the teacher. It's about the flow of information that is access. And so to provide that under the law, to provide a free and appropriate public education, the access has to be in place. And if it's not there, the child doesn't have faith. So if we look at a number, I'm trying to give you a scenario and some of you may have a, a scenario, a little girl that I'm working with, in another state who will, is the same one who wasn't recognized as being deafblind because she has a mild to moderate hearing loss. And again, that's back to the old debate. Um, that's what my next slide says. These questions, um, I go in and apply these because this little girl has a lot of hearing they don't believe that she's deafblind. However, the problem is her vision won't compensate for her lack of hearing. Her vision is not good. And so she's missing lots of auditory information. She gets a lot of it, but she misses a lot of it. 
and therefore she can't use her hearing as a compensatory sense. So we have a student who's deaf blind who number one hasn't been recognized as such. She is now, of course, the parents really involved in advocacy efforts. But now they go back and they look at her IEP and they look at these things and she doesn't make progress. I'm sure many of you have seen this. A lot of our deafblind students don't make progress. They can go year after year with the same goals on their IEP. Again, some of you've read those, I've read them, and we don't see progress. And that's because the access piece hasn't been taken care of. The goals are written, they're in a classroom with a nice teacher, there's aids around them, but the access piece has not been put in place through an intervener or someone with skills, whatever they're called, uh, you know, the partner isn't in place. Therefore, we don't have access. Therefore, we don't have faith. And we're stuck. We are stuck at a place where the, the information isn't going in. The student won't make progress. And the sad thing is that these students are underestimated because many of them have additional disabilities. So um, again, back to this question has to be asked. It has to be applied to these students as we're determining how do we know if a student needs an intervener. Um, there are some tools out there that uh, have been done that teens can go through and consider uh, whether the student needs an intervener or not. Uh, there's a lot of discussion. Maybe some of you've sat in on that discussion. Um, how do you know if the child is deafblind it's this. Now, in your state, there'll be different language in your regulations. So it may say that a student to be deaf has to qualify uh, for a certain level of hearing loss. Or it may say that for a student to be considered visually impaired, they have to have a certain acuity loss or field loss or CVI or something like that. So states will have in their on their regulations, how you know if a student is is hearing has hearing loss or is can be considered deaf or can be considered blind. Many states don't have anything that talks about how a student be, can be considered deafblind on their regs. And I know that Wisconsin is doing great work there, getting the term deafblindness into the regulations. And how is that determined? I can tell you that it can be a struggle if we make it so complicated. I got an email today from a parent who said to me, and it, I don't think she'd mind if I share with you her email, or excuse me, her text, because she's the one whose daughter has the mild to moderate hearing loss. Her text to me said, I'll read it to you. Um, she said, can you tell me what's the legal standard for deafness to be deaf? She said, what's the legal standard? Well, there isn't, as far as I know, maybe one of you know, a legal standard for deafness, but I've never known that. I, my background is in deaf education. I'm a, I'm a teacher of the deaf. But, you know, every state tries to put something in writing. But to be considered deaf, you know, is, is where the team has to discuss that. And it's not just about meeting a criteria to be a deaf student or the criteria to be a blind student. Our deafblind students may not, may not uh, meet that individual criteria. So we have to look at them as what the vision and hearing are in compensation. So I'll be calling this mom back later and we'll be talking about what is in their regs. How do you, cause she's trying to make a case. Again, back to this, that we, you know, it's very much harder than it needs to be. Any comments on that? I know I so many of the cases I went into and work with, 
it still has to do with people recognizing that they don't have access because they have some vision or some hearing. So any comments at this point on that? I know you're practitioners. You guys are in the trenches with these students. You 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 live this every day, and so I want it to be clear to you, you know, how to think about this because it can get very confusing. Linda, this is Jen. Okay. There is one question in the chat um, okay. related to this is just, so what I'm hearing is that it's really up to each individual IEP team to make the determination. Is that correct? Well, that's what the law says. You are correct. That's what the law says. However, if you have an IEP team who does not, that does not have a deafblind specialist there or someone with expertise in deafblindness, they're not going to know how to make that decision. So that's the caveat there. You, they have, they need someone there and it can be a Heidi, it can, or excuse me, a Heidi or a Jen or a Jolene. Uh, it can be someone from the project. It can be a deafblind specialist, but that decision should not be being made without deafblind expertise at the table. Did that help? So, you know, if we follow the law, yes, but it would be the same thing as we have to see what services, what occupational therapy services a child needs and determines what they need, but we don't have anybody with expertise in OT there. You think about it that way, it's crazy. And I've talked to um, even to interpreters and parents of kids who are deaf, and I've said, how, how does your team determine if your child is deaf or hard of hearing? And they say it's pretty simple. They just, they don't hear, you know, or they can't get information from the classroom. So they have to have an interpreter. It's not a big, huge, you know, complicated discussion, but it seems like in this field, it's it's more complicated than it needs to be. I think the key to that is you've got to have someone at the table with you who has the expertise to contribute to that discussion. Because a number of kids, including the one whose parent I sent you the quote by, they, they determined she wasn't deafblind and they didn't have expertise at the table. Okay, so let's, I just wanted you to be familiar a little bit with what's happening nationally. Things are shifting nationally. Um, you know, we've got the, the level of where you're at in the classroom with the students, but we're working very hard to have these things recognized on a federal level so that we don't have to keep battling this. And they're, um, the Alice Cogswell and Sullivan Macy legislation has been around since about 2014. We've been trying very hard to get that passed as a bill in Congress. You've probably heard a little bit about it. It has Title I for children who are deaf, Title II for children who are blind, and then Title III for deafblind. So um, if you look at the bottom one here, Students who are deafblind will have access to trained and qualified interveners. So this is, you don't have to read all of this. It just shows you that it's for all sensory loss children. And specifically what is important in the deafblind arena is the wording that says trained and qualified interveners. Um, again, this is title three. So um, we want, I don't want to, spend too much time. I want to be sure and answer your question. We've, we've advocated for intervener services to be inserted right here. Here's related services. Here's the wording from the law. And you can see there what related services means. It's in section 300.34 in the law. And you can see right here, interpreter services. We've asked that intervener services be added right there. You can probably see it before psychological services and after interpreting services. So that's what our ad advocacy has been the last few years. We've been doing it a number of years. 
uh, one of our problems. We don't find that people are in a disagreement at the federal level. We just find that because IDEA doesn't come forward, there hasn't been a vehicle to add this language or this wording. But we also have asked to, because every service here has an explanation. So interpreter services are explained, um, speech language pathology services are explained. So this is our proposed explanation of intervener services. And it has to do with faith through access to information communication in the child's mode of communication. So that's wording that you may see. We've done advocacy work on it. I wanted you at least know that there's efforts being made at that federal level to try to change. You know, we see change in the trenches. We see change, you guys, uh, par or teachers, parents, anyone who can recommend these types of services and ensure as you're working with these children that they have this access. You can, you know, bring up the questions, ask the hard questions about what these students can and can't do. Um, I wanted to also, I we will, but this is personnel prep. Um, also with letters, uh, we have a very strong Senator Casey, who's from Pennsylvania, who's very much an advocate for deaf and deafblind children. He has been very supportive. He sent a letter. He and Senator Markey and two other senators sent a letter in the last few months to the Department of Ed saying, we want to know how we're going to get inter uh, personnel that's trained, including interveners, because we have to have trained personnel. Um, there was a reply from Valerie Williams, who is the OSEP person, saying, we need more funding so we can do it. Now, again, I'm sharing this with you so that you can see that work is happening at the federal level. Communication is happening at the federal level. Uh, the word intervener is circulating at the federal level. This just occurred in the last month. This parent, again, to show how important parents are, the one who emailed me today lives in the state where Senator Patty Murray lives. And she's the one who's been talking to Senator Murray. And this is a result of her work. She's the chair of the Appropriations Committee. They're the ones who release the appropriations bill for the next year. So, right? So they're working on FY23. And they put together a proposed appropriations bill, and they now have included intervener language in two places in the FY23 appropriations because they want to send a strong message that the Department of Ed needs to do something, right? The Department of Ed, OSEP, they, this needs to get on the radar. So they've asked the department to direct additional resources to preparing personnel to serve children, including interveners. So there's the word there. They've also said, we want to make sure that children who are deafblind, uh, their abilities and needs are met, including through intervener services. Okay. And they are asking that in the fiscal year 2024, that the department will report back to them on what they've done. So this is a big deal because they're asking for accountability through the Department of Ed. And they want families and parents and teens to be aware of interfener services as soon as possible. This is a big step. So again, um, I wanted you to be aware because I know we have a lot of people on the call and a lot of people who are working with these children who are interacting. You guys are on IEP teams, you're there when these decisions are being made. And I want you to be able to say, you know, we're not, it's not just something that's happening at this level with us at the IEP. This discussion is happening everywhere. And we need to be in our district and in our work with these children, we need to be informed and we need to be proactive about getting these for these kids. Um, Okay, again, what impact can they have? I wanted to share with you some examples 
and then we'll take questions. Um, I'll just track back a little bit to, again, this little girl and this mom that we were talking about who wasn't designated as deafblind, whose IEP team doesn't, didn't think she needed an intervener. So here's an example of what her school situation has been like for her. Um, I've told this story, I think, to Heidi and them, but I'll share it because it tells so clearly the impact of even a mild to moderate hearing loss. So that's not this little girl, but just think of any little child who's deafblind. She was um, in a classroom where her teacher was working with her and her teacher gave her a tissue, pulled out a tissue out of the box and then handed it to her and said, blow your nose. And this little girl sat there with kind of a blank stare on her face and didn't do anything. And then the teacher said again, more impatiently, blow your nose. And then she put the tissue out toward the little girl. Well, the little girl took the tissue and then she tried to put the tissue on the teacher's nose so that the teacher would be blowing her nose. And of course, at that point, the teacher took the tissue back, got impatient, and just, you know, did it for the little girl. So this little girl in these reports, her behavior looks like it's non-compliant, right? Like she just sits there and ignores you, or she doesn't do what she's told to do. Now, if we think about a mild to moderate loss, those of you that might already figure this out, she was missing these little pieces of information. She could hear blow nose, but she couldn't hear your or my, right? So she didn't know if the teacher said blow my nose or if the teacher said blow your nose. So she guessed. So if any of you now, as you go back and you work with your students, you look for that stare, look for that blankness, look for, and then ask yourself if you're just talking to these students, because their approach to this little girl was, we'll just talk to her, she'll get it. If we just keep talking to her, she'll understand it all. But it's not adequate because that doesn't give this little girl full access and she doesn't make progress. So I wanted to share that example with you so that you may have seen that or see that when you're working with these kids, if you if there's no response, if they don't seem to be getting it, you've got to ask yourself, am I sure that the information got in? How do I know that the information is getting in? If, if I'm just talking, that's not good enough. I've got to be doing something, tactile signing or signing or some kind of system. I wanted to show you this little gal who has so many, dis many disabilities. And um, I'll have to show you a different video now. Let's see, where did I get to? Okay, I'm gonna show you this video. This little girl has no eyes and so she doesn't see. She has some hearing, but not enough and always has been underestimated in her schooling. Again, that's another one of the sad things about deafblindness is our students are underestimated because if the information's not getting in, there's no system to get it out. So their evaluations and their testing is not good. So I'm gonna pull this up to you so that you can see it. Uh, I couldn't get it to play in my I can't get it to play in my in my uh, computer in my PowerPoint. So just give me a second. Let's see. I'm going to share again. Okay, so they're doing math, and this little gal has been. They've started doing more and more um, communication with her, but it's all tactile. Again, she does tactile communication. Her intervener here, uh, I didn't get that up to you. Let's see. Let's see I'll have to try it again. Sorry, I'm slow here. Let's 
Okay, so can you see that? I think you can. Okay, so this little gal, that's her intervener. This is her intervener. She's a high, she's a credentialed, highly skilled intervener, and they're doing math. So I just wanted to show you an example. Uh, this little girl this last year has blown everybody away because she is quite brilliant when it comes to mathematics, but there was no way for her to show that until a system was developed with her interveners. So I'll go ahead and play it. It's time for math. We're going to multiply our numbers today. We're going to start with multiplying fours by fours. We're going to multiply our numbers today. This time, our number sentence. I want you to read. Okay, four. You said four times one equals what? What did four times one equal? We got to find out. We can also add one plus one plus one plus one and find the same as four times one. So let's check it out. We read one plus. One plus one plus ten. We can add on our abacus to find what four times one equals. And what one plus one plus one plus one equals to find our answer. You want to get your abacus on your way. Right. Let's bring the torch. Let me get your abacus. Now we have to set all of our numbers over to the right. So we're going to add four ones together to find the answer. So we're going to use four rows on our abacus. First row, we're going to count one. One. Good job. Second row. One. Let's get out the third row. One. And on the fifth row. One. So four times one equals what? Let's count. One. Two, three, four. And stop. Good job. You counted four and stopped. Okay, we can get our abacus back on the table on the right. 
Well, we have to find number four on our number line. So when you find four, tell me the stop. We'll start with zero. Good job, searching. Stop. Good job. We stopped. All right, let's take our four and put it at the very end of our number sentence. And let's read. Okay, so. I wanted you to see this example. This was early in the year. This little girl just, she she started with the number line and this is kind of where they started. Now she she's counting numbers way over the hundreds and she doesn't have to do such labored, you know, do moving the beads on the abacus. But they have found this intelligence related to math. And the issue was that she had to have a way to get it out. She, you know, her hands are involved. She's had a lot of barriers, but with the work of the intervener and the good people around her, she's doing math beautifully. And she counts and does by tens. When she gets to 10, then she does 10, 20, 30. But, um, you know, I just, I wanted you to see the possibilities. I see this often when you get an intervener in place who is really, you know, who has the support from the team. Obviously, it's a team effort, but who also then is, you know, involved in day-to-day uh, -day helping access information. We see a lot of amazing progress. Um, I I know it, we're getting close to the ending. I'm wondering if there's any questions now. Jen, do we have some questions? Sure. Let me just come on. Okay. There are several questions. Um, could you touch on how communication for each student is different? Okay. That's a great question because it is. There is not one size fits all. And what we have to look at, of course, is like with this little gal, if we use her in a, as an example, you know, she her hands are limited in mobility. And so the tactile communication is always a good place to start, always. I don't see that enough. I see students with vision loss who are being signed to in the air and they miss information because they have field losses or that kind of thing. So I always recommend to start at tactile communication and then go from there. So if the hands are involved, then we adapt, as you could see adapting. So this little gal, when she signs, she doesn't her hands are still connected to her intervener and, and they have a way of doing that. Um, one of the things that I've seen is people will put into place AAC devices and call that their communication system. That is not, I still, um, I hope I don't make anybody mad, but it is not what is recommended as a communication system. It is an expressive vehicle. It's a device that helps with the student being able to put it out, you know, to decide or make choices or whatever. And, but if people are relying on that as an input system, our students don't usually hear the voices on those. So you have to make sure that the communication's getting in and then there's some encouragement to getting it out. And it's not in just a tactile symbol. It's in this flow, what you just saw. So that's what we want to try to get to. And we have to have conversations. Your DeafBlind project there can help you design a system because pretty much I've seen that we kind of have to sit down and figure out what works. It's not just put up tactile, uh, you know, tactile objects on the wall, or it's not just putting in calendar system or giving them an AAC device. It has to be really taken to account uh, what's going on. And you have to have the intervener there. 
you know, there's many places still where there's a system, but there's no, no intervena. So the student is somehow supposed to access it visually or auditorily, but there's that breakdown all the time. So I know you probably, uh, I don't know if that's a great answer, but you need to definitely talk with people who have expertise in your project should help you do that. All right, um, the next question was, um, you shared some different resource booklets. Um, are those available in either braille or an electronic format at all? Okay, good question. The, they are available electronically. We haven't had them braille, but you can get the electronic version on the website uh, of the parent handbook, uh, the ones for parents. The ones for the teens, we can, uh, that's purchasable, I think for $7, but we can send you an electronic version if you want it. It doesn't, because it's uh, published, it doesn't come across very well electronically, but if you need that and don't wanna purchase the booklet, we can get that for you. And then we did have a couple of requests um, to possibly get a copy of the presentation slides. Okay. and. I can send, uh, I still don't get the technology. We can't download it. My, my uh, PowerPoint is so big that I can't just send it as an email to Jen, but I can always send it to you. We've talked about doing it as a Google Doc, right, Jen? So we'll work on that. So sure. That have a copy of that, yeah. And I can help you with that too. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, is there research that proves that higher education training makes the intervener more impactful with a student? That's a really good question. Uh, and that's still being debated in the field. Let's just say this, is there any research that shows that an interpreter, higher education makes an interpreter better than if the interpreter uh, did their own self-study or did online modules or went to some workshops? What would be the answer there? I mean, we don't, we don't have that, we don't worry about that with these other areas because higher ed is the way the world has worked and the way it's accepted. When, I, when I'm working on a federal level, they always, you know, if you look in the law, uh, it's recognized differently. But I can say though, that there are some excellent interveners out there who have not, gone through higher ed and they have great instincts they have um you know they have a good way of knowing how to do it so but the issue is in our field they're not paid very well so with the higher ed piece in place the uh certification they actually can in many states be paid better they're valued better Otherwise, they're still viewed, and I've watched this for t probably 10 years now, they're still viewed at a lower level. So even though whatever training we get to them, whether it's higher ed, whether it's through uh, a certificate, it's still what they're viewed at in, in the trenches. It's still how they're paid, how they're retained. We have a big turnover rate. My own state has a big turnover, like um, over 50%. Part of that is because they're not getting good pay. They're still, they're being trained in Utah. They're still considered by the agency that they're in, the School for the Deaf and Blind, as a paraprofessional. And so do you see kind of we've got a balance there? It's not that we couldn't have a great intervener outside of higher ed because we do. And on the same regard, I've had some students come through higher ed that I don't think are the best interveners. But the bottom line is, what would we recommend? What would parents want? If we ask parents, what do you want? Do you want the highest trained possible person with your child? Do you want to work with someone who's at that level? Or do you want to work with someone who still is trying to figure out what they're doing? You know, because they don't have the skills and the competencies they need. So it's a con. It's a great question, but the answer is very complicated. And you know what my opinion is from being in the field for so long, that's 
that's the only way my belief is that these people are going to be elevated and recognized for what they need to be. And higher ed does, you know, we're all that. We've all been through higher ed. It does require us to step up and to be accountable for what we're doing. So it it is a it's that level that really makes us all do better. So that's that's other than that, we haven't done a research. Um, some people would be very mad if we tried to do that. So anyway, you can see we have a difference there. But I can guarantee you that those that have gone through my program that I have seen credentialed, like the gal you just saw, they're tremendous. They're terrific. And they are professional people and they care about these kids. And I would want my child to be with them because they take what they do very seriously. And that's that that's the caliber, that's the level of people we're trying to cultivate and train. Good question. Any others? So there are several other questions, but unfortunately we are out of time. But what I'm wondering if maybe we compile that list of questions and work with you to get some answers and then share it out with everyone who signed up for the presentation today, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you, Linda, so much for sharing such great information about the role of intervener with us today. Um, thank you, all of you who took time out of what I imagine is a very busy start to a new school year. We were very glad that you were able to log on and hopefully learn about interveners. Um, we do have, Jolene put in a survey um, into the chat and if you could just take a few minutes to fill that out, it really does help to make our programming stronger for the deafblind kids in Wisconsin. It's also the way that you are going to request um, CEUs and a certificate of attendance. We will send you additional information once you fill that out. Um, and lastly, just don't hesitate to reach out to WDB TAP if you have questions about interveners, or about working with a student who is deafblind. We really are here to support you. So thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. And terrific job there, Jim. I uh, can't say enough good things about your project there in Wisconsin. I just have high regard for them. So well, thank you. Wonderful. So thank you for taking your time. And if you have any questions, let us know. I can tell you're great people. Thank you. WESP-DHH Wisconsin Deaf Blind Technical Assistance Project WDB TAP. The logo for the Ideas That Work is displayed and reads, The contents of this presentation were developed under a grant from the U.S. Department of Education H326T180044. However, those contents do not necessarily represent the policy of the U.S. Department of Education, and you should not assume endorsement by the federal government.